As a group, the limb girdle muscular dystrophies present challenges um, to the genetic approaches uh, for multiple reasons. Um, one is that there's many of them. You know, at this point, between the dominantly and the recessively inherited disorders, um, we have a, a couple of dozen uh, identified genotypes that cause neuro, uh, neuromuscular disease. And so it's a heterogeneous group, but they also can present at various points in the lifespan in terms of their phenotype. Somebody with the same gene could have a very severe presentation from a very young age or may not even have any symptoms until they're well into their adult life. And so when you're trying to think of an approach that's going to be a one size fits all for that broad of an experience of disease and that many different approaches, you can imagine that it's much more challenging. Um, some people have a clinical diagnosis of LGMD based on having proximal weakness in the limbs, um, but it may be challenging to actually determine what gene is causing that. And we can sometimes do other tests like a muscle biopsy to look for whether certain proteins are missing from the muscle when we stain for them with immunostaining. Um, but if we can't find that gene mutation that is actually causing the problem and has been described before in that disease, sometimes we're left without a diagnosis. And of course, you can't replace a gene if you don't know what gene is the problem in the first place. But the reverse is also true that these genes are highly what we call pleiotropic, which means that they're variable in the general population that you'll see some sequence changes because they're often large genes and they have a lot of variability in the different nucleotides involved. And so just because you have a mutation in the gene does not necessarily mean that that's causative of whatever symptom brought the person to the clinic. You have to have a really good uh, phenotype genotype correlation where you actually put together what you're seeing in the patient in terms of their exam and what their symptoms are um, to what you're finding genetically on these panels that are sent. And there's a number of times in the clinic that I've seen a patient referred in with a diagnosis based on a genetic test that really doesn't fit uh, the overall profile of that gene. And when you look into it further, there may be totally asymptomatic family members that carry that same change um, or other people reported in the literature that have different disorders related to that gene change than what you're seeing in the patient. And you have to do some further sleuthing to, care, to f figure it out fully. Again, looking at things like biopsy and other techniques um, to try and better clarify exactly what is causing the issue for that person. So at the end of the day, um, having a confident diagnosis of which type of limb girdle um, dystrophy you're dealing with is very important for the purposes of uh, designing a genetically transferred treatment. And then you have the other layers of how it becomes complicated, such as the fact that having different tissues involved in the body can sometimes make it harder to target those tissues with tropism uh, of the transgene that you're trying to deliver and also might make somebody more prone to safety events related to um, the stress of going through the viral vector delivery and the initial expression of the transgene that the body may not be familiar with. And so having safety events is another concern. We also don't want to be overly aggressive with our treatment and say, you know, we're going to treat very early in someone who may not even manifest symptoms that are much milder until later in life, um, or um, treating somebody who has tissues involved that we're not able to target very effectively and therefore doesn't benefit very much from the intervention that we're doing. And this leads to it being quite a complicated endeavor. There has been early success in some of the gene transfer research trials of picking targets that are amenable to this approach, have good tropism uh, in terms of the delivery to the the target tissue and seem to have a therapeutic response. So we can use that as a scaffolding to help build into some things that are either more complex in terms of their phenotype or more rare in terms of their genotype and might be harder to target initially because it's difficult to find the number of patients that we might need to actually assess therapeutic response. I think the the drug development pipeline and the path to FDA approval is is really difficult for ultra rare diseases. It's difficult to find enough patients to test these therapies on and then find enough patients to make these therapies commercially viable. So there are multiple points along the drug development path where ultra rare diseases are at risk of of not um, not making it through. What what I find particularly exciting 
in terms of drug development is that there's increasing recognition that this is a problem that should be dealt with. And so there has been discussion about how do we streamline drug development for ultra-rare diseases such as limb girdle muscular dystrophy? Can we take platform approaches? And we saw examples of other diseases where uh, where platform approaches are being taken for clinical trials where uh, a single setup is established, typically in a network, and multiple therapies can be tested at once. And this provides for more economies of scale and efficiency. And, you know, it's very hard to tell in advance what uh, which therapy is going to work. Unfortunately, not every therapy under development will make it to FDA approval. Not every therapy is necessarily efficacious or safe. And so we do have to study multiple ones to find the handful that will work for any particular disease. It's very exciting that now we're thinking about ways to develop these therapies in parallel rather than one at a time, because given the number of ultra-rare diseases, if we take this one at a time, it'll just take way too long.